Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Zaykum. I'm Dr. Dina Abuzaina. I would like to thank those of you who attended our online infection control course a few weeks ago. We would like to upload this video to serve as a summary and as a reminder to the topics that were discussed during the course. For those of you that couldn't, this video is for you as well. This video is going to summarize the points that were discussed during the online infection control course. Why is infection control so important? Why has it become such a backbone in all healthcare facilities worldwide? We live in a world full of microorganisms. These microorganisms are invisible to the naked eye, of course. We have bacteria, we have viruses, we have fungi, we have parasites. All of these are considered microorganisms. Some of them are beneficial to our health and others are extremely harmful. Now, how do these microorganisms get to us? The CDC has defined something called the chain of transmission or the chain of infection. The chain of transmission or the chain of infection basically summarizes the pathway of the harmful microorganism and how it gets inside your body to produce symptoms or result in infection or disease. The portal of entry, the portal of exit, as well as the mode of transmission are essential components of the chain of transmission or the chain of infection that are targeted by infection control practitioners worldwide. Knowing that these microorganisms exist amongst us, we're unable to see them, thus we're more unprotected than we should be. What can we do to make sure that we stay protected? First and foremost, the most basic practice of infection control is, of course, hand hygiene. Now, what is hand hygiene? Why is it so important? Why is everyone stressing about hand hygiene? Either it be the WHO, the CDC, your mom at home, why is everybody stressing about hand hygiene so much? Well, first and foremost, don't we use our hands? We use our hands for everything. We use our hands for eating, we use our hands for drinking, for driving, for texting, for writing, for using our phones. All of these activities may lead to possible contamination or your hands might pick up something that is possibly contaminated. Hands are the most common way that microorganisms are transmitted from one place to another or from one person to another. For those of us working in the healthcare institution, we always take care of our patients, okay? We tend to sometimes uh, interact with our patients to be more friendly, to provide psychological support and so on. Now, these patients are obviously colonized or possibly contaminated because they are first and foremost their patients. They've come to the healthcare institution for healthcare reasons. They're seeking healthcare. Once we touch these patients without washing our hands, we can transmit any possible infection or any possible bacteria from that patient to another. This is why hand hygiene is so important. These bacteria or these, mi these microscopic organisms can eventually lead to infection by coming into or going into your nose or mouth or eyes or even cuts in your skin that you cannot see. You know that invisible paper cut that you may get that you only are aware of when you spray some alcohol on it or some lime juice or lemon juice comes on it? Exactly what I'm talking about. These microscopic cuts are also a way for infection or microorganisms to enter the body. That's why it's so important to keep your hands so clean. The WHO or the World Health Organization has identified a way to prevent or to disinfect the hand from most microorganisms. Keep in mind, we're not completely eliminating the microorganisms present on our hands, but we're significantly reducing the numbers. There are two different ways of hand hygiene according to the WHO. There's of course hand washing and hand rubbing. From the name, hand washing means you're using water and soap, and of course some sort of drying item such as a towel or a tissue. While the hand rubbing, you're using a rub, an alcohol-based hand rub uh, to disinfect your hands. The steps are fairly similar, However, the, the main differences, of course, include the duration. Uh, the hand rub is, of course, from 20 to 30 seconds, and the hand washing is from 40 to 60 seconds. The hand washing is used also when the hands are visibly contaminated, when dealing with Clostridium difficile cases, as well as when dealing with an MDRO case. Hand washing is also used, especially during outbreaks in the healthcare facility, as well as the community. Hand rubbing is used during something we call the five moments. Hand hygiene during these five moments has been shown to significantly reduce healthcare associated infections. What are the steps of hand hygiene? First and foremost, we must take off any jewelry, any rings, any watches off of our hands. Why? Because these jewelry items, either rings, bracelets, watch, watches, or anything else, they harbor bacteria or viruses on them. So in order to ensure proper hand hygiene, we must remove these items from our hands. Then we would take a small 
dab of alcohol gel. Spread the alcohol gel in this manner throughout the entire surface of the hand. And then intertwine the fingers in this manner. Again, moving up and down on both hands. Intertwine the fingers and rub back and forth or up and down. After such, you would grasp your fingers as so and move again up and down. So you're disinfecting the front and the back sides of the fingers. After that, you would take your index finger, rub along and then encircle your thumb and pull upwards. And finally, disinfect the area under your nails as nails are also areas of high bacterial growth. After such, or after using an alcohol rub, you would eventually let your hands dry. The hand washing method, you would use the same steps. However, you would eventually take a tissue, dry your hands and turn off the faucet and then discard the tissue. If you've noticed that you would need a tissue to dry off your hands after using an alcohol rub and you've used just too much. Now that we've done hand hygiene, the majority of us in healthcare institutions would go on to wear our PPEs. What is PPE? Ever heard of that term before? Well, PPE or personal protective equipment are equipments or items that we use or that we wear to provide an extra layer of protection to ourselves. Can you think of anything that most of us use? If you thought of the mask, then you are 100% correct. The surgical mask is a PPE. Now, PPE protects the wearer's skin, protects the wearer's mucous membranes, and protects the wearer from any blood or body fluids that may come out or that may be available in the environment. What kinds of PPEs can you think of besides the surgical mask or besides the regular mask? There are gloves, there are gowns, there are safety glasses or safety goggles, there's in the, the coveralls or the hazmat suits, there's helmets, there's head covers. All of these are considered PPEs. They're items that you wear to provide an extra layer of protection to yourself. The most important thing in PPEs is knowing the types of PPEs that you use in your healthcare facility or in your facility and two things, the donning and the doffing sequence. How to put on, donning, and how to take off, doffing sequence, okay? Now, each of these sequences has two different methods that can be used, either the CDC method or the WHO method. Now, the CDC method in the donning sequence starts off with hand hygiene. After hand hygiene, you put on your gown. Make sure, of course, that you tie your gown in the back of your neck and at the back of your waist. After that, you would put on your mask, your surgical mask. Make sure to handle the mask only by the ear loops or by the ties. Tie it in the top of the head and at the base of the neck. After that, you would go on to put on your safety goggles or your face shield. Please try not to use both. Using both can eventually lead to possible patient harm. Why is that so? Usually when you're using safety goggles, the safety goggles might start to fog over. When it's fogging over and you're wearing a face shield that might be scratched up, then you're unable to see exactly what you're doing. So either use goggles or a face shield and not use both at the same time. The last thing that we put on is the gloves. Now, I like to remind people this method by using the following technique. First of all, I tell them to raise their arms up and then count from down up. One, two, three, four. So my sequence would be gown, mask, goggles, and then my gloves. This is the CDC method for donning PPEs. The WHO method has a slight change. We, of course, start off with hand hygiene and then we put on our gloves. After that, we go on to put on our gown, our mask, and then our goggles. The next thing is, of course, the doffing sequence. I've put on my PPEs in the correct manner. I've begun my work and I finished my work with the patient. Now, how do I take this off? First and foremost, what's the most contaminated item that you've been dealing with? Your gloves. For instance, here I am wearing some gloves. Now, how would I take these off without contaminating myself? Glove to glove, skin to skin. Use the glove to touch the glove. Don't use your glove to touch the skin or vice versa. So I would take my gloved hands just as so. I would grasp the glove in this manner and then pull it upwards. Basically, I'm not touching my skin. I've just touched the glove. After that, I would take the discarded glove, ball it in my hand, and then use my fingers to grasp the glove from the underside of the glove itself. I'm touching my skin, moving it as so and pulling it upwards, and eventually creating a ball of discarded gloves. And then I, of course, I would discard this as waste. After taking off the gloves, 
I would then go on to proceed to take off my goggles or my safety goggles or my face shield. I would not be wearing both as we've just discussed. After taking that off, I would eventually take off my gown, making sure of course not to touch the front portion as it is the most contaminated part of the gown. I would rip the gown from the back, turn it inside out and then roll it into a ball and then discard it. The final thing I would be taking off of course would be the surgical mask or the mask in journal. I would use the ear loops to take them off or break the ties and then discard the mask without of course touching the front portion of the mask. After taking off all of my PPEs, I would go back to perform hand hygiene. Okay. While we're wearing our PPEs, we have to make sure that we don't touch anything that is unnecessary. We gather our items before we start wearing our PPEs, and then we wear our PPEs and take our tray or our items that we're going to be using to the patient to provide medical care or health care as needed. If the glove itself is ripped, make sure to pause, discard the ripped gloves, perform hand hygiene and put on a new pair of gloves and resume providing care to the patient. The last thing, of course, is try as best as you can to avoid touching any of your PPEs while you are taking care of your patient. You've begun actual healthcare, try to avoid adjusting your gown or your goggles. Perform proper donning before you start caring for the patient. After we've performed our hand hygiene and worn our PPEs, the last basic step in infection control is implementing our precautions. We have two different types of precautions. We have the standard precautions and then we have the transmission-based precautions. The standard precautions include multiple infection control practices that are implemented to make sure that you protect yourself and other patients. For instance, hand hygiene is considered part of your standard precautions. So is wearing PPE. What about overall hygiene? Is also considered a part of your standard precautions. What about waste management? True, it is also considered a part of standard precautions. Aseptic technique use, disinfection, sterilization, all of these are considered parts of standard precautions. Even respiratory etiquette. When you have to sneeze or cough, what do you do? We said in the previous video, the best thing you can do is take a tissue, cough and sneeze, throw it away, and then perform hand hygiene or just dab it out. You would use the inside of your elbow to cough or sneeze to contain the droplets that are escaping from your mouth. What about transmission-based precautions? Well, transmission-based precautions are applied to in addition to the standard precautions. Now, what does that mean? Well, the transmission-based precautions include an extra level of security or protection to yourself from other patients. These patients are usually extremely colonized or extremely infectious. That's why we add an extra layer of protection. The transmission-based precautions are applied to the patient in addition to the standard precautions. I would not enter an isolated patient's room without, for example, performing my hand hygiene. I would not enter unless I'm wearing my PPEs as appropriate. Now that there are three kinds of precautions. You have the contact, droplet, and of course, the airborne precautions. The contact precautions are generally applied to patients that are heavily colonized with contact transmissible infections. Can you think of any? What about uh, MDRO patients? Usually they're dealt with under contact precautions. A patient with Clostridium difficile. We have to implement contact precautions while dealing with a patient with Clostridium difficile. When you're dealing with a patient with lice or scabies, you would have to deal with them under contact precautions. Now, what would I be needing during my contact precautions? First of all, you're contacting the patient, you're touching the patient. So you have to protect yourself from touching anything possibly contaminated. What would be used to protect yourself or protect the contact or stop the immediate contact between you and your patient? You would eventually wear your gown and then your gloves. Droplet-based precautions. What does that mean? Well, from its name, droplet precautions, the patient that you're entering to or you're going in to take care of has a respiratory infection that can be transmitted through droplets. These droplets are invisible to the naked eye. Can you think of any diseases that can be transmitted through droplets? 
pneumonia, influenza, I mean, all of these can be transmitted through droplets. So what would I need to protect myself from these droplets? I would eventually need a surgical mask. The last precaution we have is the airborne precautions. The airborne precautions are usually the most transmissible form of infections. Why? Because these particles or these microorganisms can transmit or can fly basically in the air because their size is so small that the air currents carry them through the air. Can you think of any? Tuberculosis is the first one that comes to mind. Measles, chicken pox, all of these can be transmitted through the air. Now, what would I need while going to take care of a patient under isolation or airborne isolation precautions? I would need a high efficiency respirator. The high efficiency respirator includes, of course, N95s, N99s, FFP1s and 2s and 3s. All of these are high efficiency respirators. Please stay away from valved respirators as the CDC does not condone them and they can actually cause more harm than good.